ultimately my relationship is not determined by how masculine I am or how feminine my wife is, but it's really determined by the, the kind of attitude and then investment that each of us makes in the relationship. Hey, you're listening to the Blessed Couple Podcast, where we talk about how to do this marriage thing and experience God in the process. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. Let's get started. Hey, amazing. So I'll shortly introduce myself. My brother hasn't joined yet for some reason. Hope he will help me out in a moment. <laughs> so my name is Peter. Uh, I come from Sweden. I am 25 years old. And me and my twin brother, Johannes, we are going to be hosting this event for you guys this, this hour. Where we are going to be talking to these amazing husbands and fathers. We have heard so much about them before this. And we're really excited for this. And they have a lot of things to share with you. So I'll start the, the, the first question. And actually, maybe we should introduce everyone in the chat. So maybe we can start with, I can, I can say your name. So Samuel? You want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, Peter. I see you. Uh, I'm from the UK at the moment, living in Korea. Blessed to lovely green lady. And no kids yet. 32 years old. Good having a cool discussion with you. Awesome. And we have David Freeland. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is David Freeland, and I am half English, half Swedish, married to a half American, half German. And uh, I'm a bit Jewish too, so I got some some roots there. And uh, yeah, very happy to be here. I'm calling in from Sweden. Yeah, I've got, we have a, Lily and I have one son together so far. We just turned four years old. Amazing. It is very unusual if you, if you marry someone that is not a half. So mm -hmm. that's quite, quite normal for, for, I think, our church. Um, Jonathan Makonen. Hey, good to see you guys. I'm Jonathan. Feel free to call me Yoni. That's what friends are allowed to call me. No, just kidding. Uh, any, uh, anything is fine, Jonathan. Or Yoni. Uh, I'm 30, living in Germany. I'm also half, half Austrian, half Finnish. My wife is Yara from the States, uh, from California. We've been blessed for 10 years now. We have two kids, seven and eight years old. And I'm also very much looking forward to talking to you guys. Amazing. And we have Nami Huang. Hello everyone. Yeah, now I'm Huang here. I am Korean American mix. My wife is a Chinese American mix and we have three sons aged 11, nine and no, 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 I'm sorry, 11, eight and six at the moment. And uh, yeah, really happy to be here to talk to everyone and looking forward to the conversation. I'm living in awesome. Hong Kong, but well, my family's in Hong Kong. Awesome. And last but not least, we have Matthew Jones. Yes. Hello everyone. Matthew Jones, originally from the United States. A mix of Irish and English, I'm told. My wife is Korean. We were blessed in 95. I'm currently 46. This is going to be our 25th anniversary of being blessed this year. We have three daughters and three sons. The oldest is 18 and getting ready to go to college this coming fall. And our youngest is just two years old. So we have quite a huge gap. So a lot of parenting ahead for me. And in case I didn't mention it, yes, I, we live here in Seoul, Korea. Right. And Johannes has now joined us. It's amazing. So uh, I'll give it, I'll give the microphone to Johannes. All right. Hi everyone. So to start off with the first question, it's from Matthew. We've been told that he's a very masculine guy. So this uh, question will be fitting. So healthy masculinity is in general, something lacking in our church. How do you express your masculinity in a healthy way, Matt? So I guess I'll start by focusing on the first part of the the question, which was masculinity is lacking in our church. I guess masculinity is a very broad concept that can be defined in, in many ways. But just to tell you a little bit about some of my uh, experiences growing up, I, mean, I think the first thing of note is when I was a year and a half, I, I was put into a, a nursery so that my parents could go off and do mission work. I was separated from my parents for about a year and a half. And I'll never be able to truly say what exact impact that had on me as a young boy growing up, but I'm absolutely sure that it did have an impact, kind of being separated from my parents for a, a very important period in my life. And one kind of memorable experience for me was I went to this kind of, quote, personal development seminar, you could call it. Uh, this is in my early 30s. 
And part of it involved going into an Indian sweat lodge. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this or you've ever done one, but it was this new experience for me of going into this dark enclosure that was built from a kind of metal structure covered with cloth. You go in there, it's very dark. And to make a long story short, it brought up a lot of deep emotions in me that I did not know that I had. And a lot of it started with just a lot of negative emotions, like hate and anger at my parents, at you know the church that I grew up in. And a lot of it was, I think, angry because of how it impacted me. And in some ways, not being happy with who I was. And so that was kind of an eye opener. Like, wow, it was just so much negative anger. And this is coming from a guy who grew up and was like, I guess you could say like the ideal second generation kid that went to all the workshops and seemed always happy, happy go lucky, and was someone that people probably would consider to be a good second generation, happy to be part of the church community. And yet, once I got in touch with these deep emotions, I, I was really surprised. And I mean, that was kind of one experience where I kind of, my first time in my life, you know, I'm talking my thirties, where I really got in touch with some, some deeper inner emotions and I, I've done other things since then. And I think what I've kind of come to realize at the end of the day is that we inherit certain scripting from our parents, both positive and, and negative, and, and we carry it with us through our whole life. And part of our growth process is learning to become aware of what that scripting is and how it's shut us down or limited us in terms of expressing ourselves and expressing who we really are as, as growing men. And I feel like I, I've been able to make progress in terms of becoming aware of my scripting, identifying what things have, have held me back and prevented me from expressing myself as a man and my masculinity. And it really is a lifelong process, I would say. I feel like I've made progress, but I, I still have more to go. And in terms of the church in particular, I mean, I think there's something that is a fact, which is that, you know, our parents grew up, you know, if they were part of the church, which my parents were, sort of having to put themselves in a very much objective position to what Father Moon or Mother Moon were telling them to do and making sacrifices as they were asked to do. And I think some of that scripting was just always be in this like humble, objective position where we don't think for ourselves, we just are told to, you know, be obedient. And, you know, I think for some people like, you know, myself included, that scripting, you know, was passed on to me and I wasn't happy about that. I felt like it was, you know, limiting me. And so I think part of my life journey has been to identify, I work on myself. And then as it comes to like my relationship with the church background that I grew up with, it's identifying the good things and working with those and taking those into my life, but then identifying also some of the negative things and saying, I don't need to be negatively impacted by this and I'm free to say, no, thank you. So that's kind of in a nutshell, I guess, how I would throw out my first answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that's the recipe for, uh, for masculinity then. <laughs> could, I, could I add something to this? Please, please. Yeah, this is something that I'm, I'm always trying to work out, you know, the relationship between the masculine and the feminine and even what the definitions are. And, you know, it's so kind of conceptual, right? The yang, the yin, the masculine, the feminine, because you have men that are very feminine by definition or just by who they are in our minds, right? According to our definition or, of masculine and feminine. And then we have women that are very masculine, et cetera. And so this is actually, I mean, just people are like this, but father in the end says clearly, the thing that differentiates a man and a woman in the end is their sexual organ, right? And so in that case, my own interpretation, interpretation and what I, what I feel is, you know, if you're born a man, then you are that masculine representative, right? It doesn't matter. Your characteristics might be feminine by worldly standards, but this is, you know, masculine version of God that is being expressed in you. And so most importantly, in my mind, or what, how I feel is most importantly is to be you, be the best you. Try to be the best you and whatever that you is, right? The thing is we judge ourselves according to worldly standards so much what it means to be masculine, right? We need muscles, we need, you know, whatever, right? Does anybody else want to fill in? I think it's kind of interesting because like you directed that question to our movement specifically, like, oh, you know, what is, do we have a healthy conception of masculinity? Are, are men in our movement living up to that kind of healthy conception? 
I think it's not just our movement. Maybe you've heard, and I, I've definitely heard a lot of people throw on the term of crisis of masculinity generally in society. And I think it's because, you know, a lot of men struggle with finding a certain place or a certain role or knowing how to act in a way that is useful, that is contributing. And I think the society problem bleeds over into our movement. You know, sometimes we think we're a little insulated from the rest of society and we're, we're above that, but not really, are we? <laughs> we're just as susceptible. And a lot of young men struggling, not just with like pornography, which High Noon deals with, but they're just like finding a place, motivation, you know, to go out there and do something in the, in the bedrooms are playing video games all the time and understanding what it means to be, you know, a, a respected man in society. And I think that's an interesting question. For me, I think it has a lot to do with kind of taking responsibility over one's life, <laughs> I feel like, and like realizing <laughs> where, where I'll, and you know, you know, maybe that's kind of like, oh, okay. But I think realizing also that's where meaning comes from is that, you know, often we're just trying to find ourselves falling into the trap of just kind of temporary satisfaction, gratification, right? But not going deep and facing like ourselves, our weaknesses, facing our challenges in our life and owning up to that and being like, okay, well, where I really will find fulfillment is if I try to, like Nami was saying, be live the best life we can live, take resp full responsibility for my flaws and also what I want to do in life and actually go for it like as much as possible. Right. I think um, to, to have like a follow-up question, responsibility is key. But me, like many other guys, have like done what we're supposed to follow. Yeah, I'm like most other guys in our church, a relatively sweet and nice guy. <laughs> And I don't necessarily like to take charge, be a leader, be loud, or, you know, constantly feel confident, which many people would see as masculine uh, qualities. And I want to direct the question to David Freeland. How do I express my masculinity without feeling like I'm faking it? Like, do I have to pretend like I am confident all the time? Like, do you have any tips for that? Just a second. Is Nami back? Did you want to finish a sentence before we move to that question, maybe? I, I don't know where I got cut off, so oh, I see. Okay, it's all right, it's all right. we're good. We're good. Okay, so so you're asking me how to step up as being masculine, or basically how to embrace your genuine masculinity. Okay, that's a that's an interesting question. For me, it's been it's been tough finding father figures has has been something that I've I've looked for, and I found my faith is very much rooted in attending father or, or like you know giving my attention to father and, and following father when i was growing up that's what meant everything to me and it has something to do with my own upbringing my own father is bipolar and an early very early memory of my dad is that he basically was incapable of taking responsibility for his own life and he couldn't take responsibility because of his illness he was in hospital most of my upbringing and so you know there's this there's this void and it, it's still it's still here <laughs> it's still within me to seek that strength of a person who would be a man like a, a true masculine person and i think father's father's been that for me and i think as you grow as you face the responsibilities you have to take on in life and you face challenges you learn bit by bit but the more you the more you challenge yourself and the more you take on the challenges, the more confident you get at growing and, and being what you consider yourself as a, as a man. I think Nami raised the point there, like if you, if you doubt, you know, if you doubt your masculinity, just look down, you know, open your pants, observe what's hanging down there and then figure it out. But as Sam also mentioned, we're susceptible to programming and it's going on all over, uh, all over the place around us. And there is an agenda to demasculatize, whatever you call it, uh, men. And I think it also serves as a reaction. It's a reaction for women being suppressed by men for such a long time. And in this age of information, where we're constantly bombarded and guys, our eyes are where we, <laughs> you know, we're susceptible, like we're programmed to be focusing on stuff like that. That's where we're susceptible, you know? So in this age of information, it is tough discerning like what to keep your focus on to be able to step up and be a man but i think it definitely has to do with being conscious about it and making making the choices i studied i took a course on addictions uh, i also just studied about 
the programming that we get through through whatever screens, right? And now we're facing this issue with technology just being in our face all the time and screen the screens are there. So how do you, you know, learning how to focus is very important, right? And learning how to cut away those sorts of distractions that hinder us from maybe stepping up and being better husbands. And then I wanted to mention this, this whole thing, like I, I haven't really been affected by porn so much in the last, I would say maybe uh, eight years or so. And it was because I came to this point where I realized I wasn't being genuine and I would be honest with my wife about what was going on and it would hurt her so much that I just felt like this is something I've got to stop. And then, you know, I started figuring out ways to, to prevent myself from going that route. But that has definitely allowed me to step up. I mean, if you choose to get rid of porn and video games and other things, what became more important for me was becoming more productive and figuring out ways to manage my schedule and taking responsibility there, believing in that I have power, maybe not to be as, as cool as true father, but I have the power to be, be able to step up and do something and perhaps have a positive impact, if anything. And then looking at your schedule and then taking charge, putting things in there, intentional, and then, you know, taking responsibility, getting help, being willing to be of help to other people through being like an accountability person or something. That's why I really like High Noon as a program because it offers that opportunity. That's a huge way to grow and step up to being a man, I think. By, by being accountable. Men, we like to be accountable. We like to hold each other accountable. And we like, you know, we're tribal. So anyway, I'm, I'm rambling on and I, I don't know what I've said helps, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that was really, that was really good, you know, becoming a, a, a better person so that we in the future can become better husbands. And yeah, I know has helped me a lot as well. I mean, being an accountable, accountability partner and having one really has improved my life, those aspects. But speaking more about that, improving ourselves and you know becoming maybe better husbands because from what we've heard all five of you are excellent husbands but in our our church we feel that many women feel like their options for marriage is not great samuel how would you say how can we do differently men in the church really i thought i only see babe magnets in this room really no i i, I don't understand the question though. yeah <laughs> i think this is a good question. It would be, be nice to know the stats of that, but I can I can see why maybe people would think that way, or some maybe some sisters, some women would think that way. I, it's interesting. I've been thinking about it because I think one thing that is a little bit weak when it comes to the kind of whole matching and, and blessing process. If you think about normal society out there, you know, meet people naturally, they'll go on dates. And if you're, and you know, it, it falls on the man often to take initiative and that, that's masculine, right? Is learning to take initiative and to women usually want men to approach them, chase them and court them and kind of win them over. But that doesn't exist so much. I feel like in, in the matching blessing process. And usually when you, you know, out there in society, when you, you get a guy, you know, a young guy, maybe he's, he's not very socially adept, right? He's kind of shy or maybe he hasn't got many hobbies he hasn't got many good habits maybe he's, he's kind of awkward and maybe we all relate to that in some we all kind of go through that stage at some, at some point but he'll eventually want he'll get be attracted to, to a girl and want to go out and, and go date date someone but if he's not really at a certain stage like is he, if he's not what that woman wants he'll get rejected right he won't be able to make it right but that rejection often serves as a kind of a wake-up call to that guy to then try to improve their life, right? Like, like they keep getting rejected unless they kind of step up as a man, and take responsibility, kind of build their life, right? And I feel like sometimes there's a little bit missing one in terms of our church and, and matching blessing because you don't get rejected, you, usually, right? I mean, not in, that, not in the same way as like out there in society, right? I know, I, you know, I know a lot of people who have gone through kind of matchings or many different matchings or even gone through blessings, right? But that's like the end stage, you, you know, by the point you will get blessed and married, you don't want to have to be like, oh, you know, like, who is this person? They're not really who I want to be matched or, or blessed to marry to. Let's break up, right? So you want that to happen a lot before, much earlier that you start to improve your life. You start to work on things. So it's a good question. How do you do that? I think, <laughs> how do you do that without the rejection? Because the rejection, I think, is a strong kind of wake up call for a lot of guys. I think maybe it's just 
first being really aware that, you know, we can't just sleepwalk into matching and blessing and expect any girl to kind of open up her arms and just embrace us with everything, right? Like, we have certain expectations we want of women as well, right? It's not just for men, I think, as well. It goes the same for girls. And we, I think the other aspect, the other side of it is like we're raised with this kind of really high standard of trying to stay pure and, you know, not to have too much exclusive interaction with the opposite sex and in a way it's good also it's kind of double-edged sword in terms of like it, we can't we don't always learn how to socialize with women right or we don't know how to court a woman or be attractive as a man right so i think well institutionally i think we need to develop better processes for it but until that time happens i think it's also about being really aware like okay you want a, you know we want to meet a woman who is sophisticated and intelligent and trying her best in life and also knows how to be attractive, right? And knows how to be charming. Well, they expect exactly the same of us, right? What, what does anyone, anyone else think? I can add something to that. Now, I'm not the expert on the panel here, but something I have tried and I thought was very enjoyable and fun was actually to, uh, I wouldn't recommend this to everyone, but to actually go up to women and just talk to them. And so I actually went up to a girl in Germany when I was there for a layover and I went up to her and I asked for her number. She said no. And it was very awkward. And, you know, I had all these words prepared. You know, what I was going to say was going to be perfect. And when I got to her, it just turned blank. And I couldn't remember anything I was going to say. But I did approach her. And I was so proud I did. And that rejection meant a lot to me. And it's something that yeah, I definitely recommend. Maybe oh, not wow. Was anyone, that just but... like, was that just something to like, sorry to interrupt you, Janice. I just want to interject before huh? I forget. Was that something just to build up your confidence? Did you, is that why you did that? So uh, I did it actually because I want my future wife to feel like I can have anyone in the world, but I want... That like you're her. a catch, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> for, that, for that, not just to be words, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to practice. Uh, and now I don't go up hitting on girls every day, but every now and again, you know, I tell a girl she's pretty because I want that ability. I want that ability to make, to make my wife feel special. And I want to be brave enough to do it and possibly get that rejection. And the rejection, honestly, it was hard, but it felt great afterwards. I was super proud. What, what would have happened if she was like, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's go on a date? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, uh, I was just there risky, for a couple of hours, Risky, risky. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's, that's really interesting. That's a novel approach there, Johan. It's interesting. Like, yeah, fascinating, man. Good on you. I, I, I just want like, from my own experience, I feel like something that really helped me is that, especially when I was growing up as a teenager, I really pushed myself to socialize with people and others and sisters and often you know well i don't know how everyone else thinks but i think often people feel like oh, i'll wait you know when you're on a social occasion right like you go to some kind of party or whatever it is right and you wait for people to come up to you you know you're like oh you, it feels good you know some someone comes up to you they want to come talk to you and you maybe people don't always make a lot of effort i think there's different kinds of people there are people who do that there are people who, who just wait right I think what I did was I consciously was like, I'm never going to just wait for people to come up to me. I'm going to go and socialize with people. I'm going to go talk to people because I saw it as a, as a means of also loving people. I don't know, kind of in, in caring for people, if you want to put it that way. Because, you know, when someone, when you go to, up to talk to someone, they feel like, oh, you're interested in me, right? And you, you genuinely are interested in them and you ask them questions and things. And they feel good about that. And I thought, oh, that's, that's kind of a nice way to, make friends of course also kind of care about people i kind of developed like social skills develop more confidence and a lot of times it's just this kind of practice right hey if you're getting something good from this episode it would mean the world to us if you could share it with someone you love or leave a five-star review because the only way this podcast spreads around is through word of mouth so a share or a review would go a long way and it only takes like 10 seconds to do. Thanks. Back to the show. Just, just one follow up uh, about approaching girls. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would suggest not or treating it. I mean, approaching girls is absolutely okay. It's totally cool. But remember, if we can maintain even treating them as sisters, right? Even that in itself is training. Right? If you just think you're a beautiful woman, right? But you say it with a heart that you're sincerely saying it to a sister. That's where the danger comes in. I think this is something, 
Yeah, it's, it, I think it's great to be able to compliment a woman confidently, right? That's actually really great. Like if you can do that, but at the same time, when you say those words, there's no ulterior motive. There's no like, oh yeah, you know, you're, you're really cute. Yeah. But instead it's, it's a genuine appreciation. Then yeah, that's actually God expressing love to the sister through you. But if we can practice doing that, then we can be really confident. We can be totally at ease with who we are. So yeah, but it takes practice, right? And in our culture, we have a tendency to kind of, you know, separate the brothers and the sisters. And then if you start talking like that, then it, it gets awkward. You know, it's like, is he hitting on me? Or, you know, oh, I don't know if I should talk. But I, I genuinely feel and believe that we need to have a much more real brother-sister relationship in our community. So being able to so, uh, as well as make fun of our sisters whenever. Right? So Johannes's first question of this panel was, you know, about masculinity and but now we really know what he's really asking which is how to pick up girls but that's what he's really <laughs> wanted, wanted to find out. oh damn <laughs> Buster. <laughs> well um if i can also give you m my perspective on this because uh, as someone who um yeah of course was a teenager went through all those things but now i have teenage kids myself i have an 18 year old daughter a 16 year old son and my wife and I have discussed how do we want to raise them and what approach, you know, we're, we're trying to take with them. And basically, like you said, I feel like it is healthy for them to learn how to socialize, interact with people of, of the opposite gender and become friends with them. And I've tried to counsel them to consider them as your brother or sister. But within that framework, like you guys can become friends. And that was something that I didn't quite get to have, you know, when I was growing up, it was, it was more strict. And fortunately I give the credit more to my wife, but our kids are very open with us. And so, uh, the point that I'm, I guess I'm getting to is I, I do think there is, it is healthy to practice putting yourself out there because ultimately I think we are all striving for self-expression and in one way or another, and part of expressing ourselves is putting ourselves out there. You know, we'll go through some periods of rejection, but eventually, hopefully, there'll be acceptance as well. And that can be not only in relationships, but also in your, in the work that you do and ultimately, you know, how you make a living as well. Yeah. All right. I think uh, if you're facing a woman besides your mother for the first time, when you're in a matching process, then something was a little off, I think. <laughs> <laughs> While on the topic of culture in our church, we have like, yeah, you know, like don't talk to brothers and sisters, live for others, possibly deny yourself. And uh, Jonathan, um, you are a counselor, right? Yeah. And uh, if everyone in our church, if everyone is living for the sake of others, you know, the, the world is perfect, but not everyone is living for, the, for, for everyone else. And what could go wrong? in our culture and our movement and the cultures we have yeah the first thing i wanted to say i know we kind of got hyped on this call we should maybe ask or bring our wives up here to uh, to kind of judge if we're a really good husband <laughs> 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 uh, but anyway yeah i was really thinking and reflecting a lot about this topic actually recently about kind of the balance between giving everything for other people for your wife and then also taking care of your own needs, you know, this kind of balance. It's a very, very interesting question. And I think in our movement, often there's maybe wrong concepts about it. And there's probably a tendency of, you know, kind of denying yourself, denying like this aspect of self-respect, where are my boundaries, where's my health, my personal health, which is actually a really important basis to be able to truly and sustainably be there for others. Also in relationships, I think, and also my personal relationship, I feel like I've experienced that a lot in the sense that me as a person, I'm also just in general, like really like a helper kind of person. Like there's people who are, who just get a, a lot of joy out of being there for others. Also in my job as a social worker and counselor, you know, just listening to people all the time. And then maybe there's people that tend to be more aware of themselves and like kind of have to practice are selfish as a nature and then have to practice to be more there for others. But I just realized in my relationship, there were phases where I definitely didn't reflect enough on what is important for me, you know? And I feel like I was often just trying to please my wife in every possible way, you know, whenever she felt she was struggling or 
whenever I felt she was struggling. And it came to a point where I felt like that was a, becoming a big problem in our relationship. And honestly, I even realized that even maybe subconsciously, my, my wife really didn't like that anymore. You know, that I was just always trying to be, to fix everything and to make her I feel like I was limiting my wife's growth through that attitude. So I just got to learn to be much more honest to myself and actually sometimes realize, of course, it's always important to be empathetic and to be there for each other, but don't avoid, like, I just realized if you come to a point where you just have something going on in yourself and you're just not bringing it up for the sake of the other person, then that's kind of this wrong kind of denying that is going on and me being more aware of that has really helped me and has actually transformed my relationship to my wife a lot and i think that's also kind of the reason sometimes why at least in in, in our society there's often this concept that like women like these kind of badass kind of guys that just are kind of douchebags you know i think that's kind of an extreme version and it may be sometimes an abusive version but just kind of this concept that women also are attracted to men who know what they want, who, who know what is important for them. And again, I think the balance is very important and a lot of, there's also this other extreme, but I feel like in our movement regarding masculinity and how you define relationships and what is important in relationships, I feel like sometimes we're too much about, you know, oh, I, I need to make my wife happy. Of course, I do want to make my wife happy, but I think it's really important and I think I can truly make my wife happy if I communicate honestly with her and openly with her and reflect together with her on what's important for both of us equally. Amazing. I think that can be that, that I suppose that's a very hard one in a relationship to find that balance, taking care of yourself and serving your partner. I think maybe that goes for any relationship, right? You were talking in the end about communication and what, what your spouse might need. And I want to bring in Nami for this one. And I think not having been in a relationship, I think we hear a lot like, wow, communication is so important. And I say every, almost every second workshop or testimony, it's like communication is so important. And um, maybe, Nami, could you share a bit why do you think that communication is important? Well, communication is important. We can see even right here, right? How does, an, how does a dialogue like this generate power? Because we're communicating. We are sharing our stories. We're sharing our situations. You know, for example, at White High Noon talks about pornography, right? And oftentimes when people st struggle with these kind of things or any kind of addiction, any kind of problem, you know, you hide it. You don't communicate it to anyone. You don't let it out. But the support groups in the end, be it Alcoholics Anonymous or, or you know, any other group like that, it's people are coming together to communicate about their difficulties. And when they realize, wow, I'm not the only one. And actually, this is a common problem or there are other people like me and they've gone through it. They've made it through. They're on the other side. There's hope for me too, right? And it opens a whole new door. So first of all, power comes from give and take. We, we learned this, right? And this is something we, we know conceptually, but it's the reality is we gain power like this for our lives through communication, through opening our hearts, opening ourselves and not holding any of this information back. If we don't let that information flow, then it, it rots. It becomes a problem and a deeper, bigger problem. And so it's a weight on our hearts and it actually holds us down and limits us. But um, communication, also practically speaking, Everyone is different, right? This goes back to the idea of, you know, masculinity, and femininity or, or whatever, right? Being quiet type or, or active type. Everybody is different. No, you know, nobody's the same, even among guys. Or there's the guy-girl difference. There's a cultural difference. There's a family difference. There's the, you know, upbringing difference, experience difference, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There's, so no two people are the same. So it's only through communication that we can build our common base, right? And we can expand our common base and grow our common base. And fact of the matter is, the person that you need to have the biggest, deepest, broadest common base with is the person that you're going to spend your life with, your eternity with, right? So how do we build that common base? Through communication, right? And we are constantly growing through my own experience of it being blessed and married and having kids. I'm growing. I'm changing, right? I'm not the same person. I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm not the same person that I was when I married my wife or, you know, I've grown, I've matured. I've also realized, you know, that I have deeper problems than I thought, right? Maybe at that time, I didn't even know that I had these problems. But as life, as the challenges of life come up with work, with, you know, very, with children and all these things you go through, at each stage of your life, there's a new test or a new challenge. And then your true self or your, or your root self, your core self is exposed on another level. And then there, you have other things that you, maybe you have strengthened certain parts before, 
but this part was not developed because it wasn't challenged before. And now it's being brought to the forefront. Oh my gosh, now I have to grow here. Oh, I'm so weak or I'm so, you know, and then I can't manage my kids or I don't know how to love my son or I don't know how to, you know, my wife is not taking, paying attention to me or not enough, you know, before she used to, you know, we used to be so intimate, but now without, with the kids around, it's, it's not so easy anymore. You know, ah, it, you know, whatever the situation may be, we are growing too through this whole experience, right? And so as we grow, then we have to communicate how, if I'm changing, if I'm growing, or if I'm being exposed to this part of me that I didn't even know I had, like this weakness or whatever that I didn't even know about, then how can my wife know? And one really common mistake, at least that I've made along my journey, is assuming that my wife knew what I wanted. Assuming that my wife would understand my needs as a man, my needs as her husband, you know, this could be internal, it could be external physical needs, right? My, my, my stomach, my holy place or whatever, right? There is that physical component, but also there's the emotional component, right? But I mean, it's easy to assume that your partner would understand you. And also it's easy to forget what they might need, right? So I might be busy focusing on how I'm feeling lack of love, whereas actually I should be loving her more. She's needing my love at this moment, right? And only through communication can we know this. You know, if, if you don't voice this, if you're missing something, you're needing something, but you don't voice it, how in the world can she know, right? And this is something that, and, and it's the same. It's like, if she's expecting me to do something, but she's never voiced it, right? And there, you know, maybe she has a new, new sense of something, right? With the third child, she has a new sense of something, but then she's hoping that I would, I would take more responsibility, but she did really well with the two children. And then the third one came along. I assume that, okay, she's going to be fine. But then, and I don't step up to do more. And then if she grows resentful towards me because of that, then, you know, of course, as an active, proactive man, ideally, I would be able to intuit that, but I'm not perfect. But my wife is amazing. She actually, she's done a great job handling all three without me. But still, the point is just that you need communication. Right? This is fundamental, not only between husband and wife, but all human beings, right? There's so much misunderstanding that happens just because we don't understand each other, right? We're not seeing where the other person is coming from. And just one example that I can give of this is, the way that we think, you know, I mean, it's, it's even down to such fundamentals is how we think, right? So Jenny, she thinks before she speaks. When she says something, it's been thought through. She's already decided that this is the best thing to say. This is the best decision I can come to. And she would make that statement, right? Whereas I, whatever pops into my head, I say it, right? And then, because I, I want to ping pong ideas, right? And then I'm waiting for them, for her to ping pong back an idea. And then we can develop something. And then we can come to a conclusion, right? Whereas anything she says, it's already like to change her mind after she's made, made a statement. I have to, you know, I got to really be tactful and skillful to do that. But then what happens is I say something and she takes it as my statement of fact, right? But I'm waiting for her to ping pong it back. So I feel like she wasn't listening to me or she just doesn't take my, my words seriously because she's not having given take with my words. Whereas she's thinking he really means that. Right. So, okay, I'm going to go with that or, you know, gosh, you know, whatever. Right. So she's taking that as, as is. And then we, we went through this. It took us more than 10 years to kind of figure out that this is the reality, which is we're growing. Absolutely. And I don't know how much more we have to grow still, but I'm just saying, this is one example of something. So it's like, you wouldn't even, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there are many, many other things, right? Yeah. Anyways, anyone else have anything to chime into about communication? I'll chime in with just one comment. Communication is of course absolutely important. There's another word that I'd like to introduce that I think is also very important, which is connection. I think that is really what we are striving for in any relationship. And connection is created through various ways, communication being at the forefront, but there's other types of connection that, that you can create. And so as far as relationships goes, I think more than masculinity or any, anything like that, I think each person's attitude in the relationship that number one, I'm committed to this relationship. And number two, if we work on our connection, we're going to create that sense of love, sense of closeness, sense of being a soulmate, and then we can achieve happiness in the relationship. And so I think the, the fundamental philosophy I think I, that I live by is that ultimately my relationship is not determined by how masculine I am or how feminine my wife is, but it's really determined by the kind of attitude and then investment that each of us makes in the relationship throughout our life. If we're not communicating, if we're not doing things to connect, uh, I feel a sense of distance or a sense of less closeness. 
but then when I turn around and we do something, we, we spend time together, we do things to connect, then I can feel happy again. And so it really is, an, you know, a, a lifelong process, but I think anybody can be happy in their relationship and, uh, again, with the right attitude and investment. Amazing. I want to uh, touch on what Nami said, 10 years, you have eternity in perspective. It's not so bad. We have actually very little time left. And there's one more question I would actually like to, it's an open question. So anyone who feels they want to share on this one, I mean, me and my brother, Johannes, we, we are both obviously both of us are uncles, they're both of us. One of us is, is a knucklehead one as well. And we've seen how all our older siblings, it's really taken a toll on them having children. And so that's quite a big question, but how would you say, how can one prepare for that? You know, that, cause it gets quite intense. I don't even see them. They're not the same people anymore. They sleep deprived and they, sometimes I don't see them talk. <laughs> um, would you have any advice for maybe couples that of having children or single that obviously at, at some point want to have children how, how can one prepare for that uh, i'd like to say one short thing to me the key is network one of the keys is network you know i see that it's a it's a really really big job of course and it's really important to have people around you or very beneficial to have people around you that can uh, help you for example we uh, had our children in austria in vienna and we didn't have any family network around us. So that was one of the main reasons why we moved back to Germany to be closer to at least my parents. And we kind of made our kids very comfortable with their grandparents, also with sleeping over and everything to be able to still have time. You know, I think it's so important to make time for a couple still. Sometimes I know it's not always possible. I know we're very blessed to have my parents very close by, but at least to have it in mind to take care of building a, a network, people that can also sometimes chime in if both parents are exhausted or just need time for, for them as a couple. Anyone wants to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, good, good point there about creating a network. And also I think, you know, there are great tools that have been mentioned on this live stream. I was particularly interested in this session with the therapists. They offered some really good tools and uh, one, one tool that I, that, you know, that's kept coming up for me is this real love material, which is really, it's good. I mean, the whole point is that you, you exercise having real love for your children in spite of all the chaos that's happening, you know, having their interest in mind when relating to them and projecting that they feel loved no matter what, in spite of all these uh, expectations. I mean, it's really hard to live up to uh, without practice. Uh, it's just like anything. I mean, even us being good husbands or whatever, right? It comes with, <laughs> it comes with practice. Communication comes with practice. So yeah, getting to the point where we overcome things that are in the way, these addictions, screen time or work or whatever, like it's constant practice. That's what's so great about stepping up to become a married person or, if, you know, having a family. It presents the opportunity. You, there's no going back without, you know, going all in and then going all in, you're growing. So that's something that came to mind. Uh, and one, one final thing I just wanted to, to make sure I, we don't overlook is always bring heavenly parent or God into the discussion, right? Because when we lose God, that's when things go haywire. It, it doesn't matter what part of your life, but when, when you lose that relationship with God, in your, especially in your relationship with your wife, it can become so horizontal. And then things can really get rocky or difficult. But as long as God is there, then you can make it through, no matter what the situation is. Okay, so, so the key to the blessing really, really is God, right? It's the whole, the whole four position foundation, right? Centered upon God, this man and woman is coming together to form a family. So just wanted to, to, to nail that in. I think that's a perfect, perfect conclusion Thank to you. this conversation. What a wonderful, what a wonderful conclusion. You know something is good when you want it to keep going, but it has to end. So I want to thank all of you gentlemen for sharing your time and your wisdom, your experience with everybody. Thank you for working so hard to come up with all these questions, Peter and Johannes. Thanks so much for, you guys have this chat that you've been sharing with each other really energetically. So thank you so much for all your preparation. These guys are all on Facebook. Maybe if you send them a message, maybe they'll get back to you. But uh, all right, that's your husband's panel, guys. 
thanks for tuning in okay see you guys you. next time thanks a lot guys thank you thank you <laughs> Hey, if you want to improve your relationship or take your sex life to the next level, well, you're in luck because more than 70% of couples that take our Love and Integrity course said that the quality of their sexual relationship improved after joining the course. Sounds good? You can join the program today with your spouse or just take the course by yourself at loveandintegrity.com. See you in the next episode.